the Ukrainian army is on the road to death. And in fact, in recent days, it's been physically on the road to death, as we're going to show you here in just a few minutes. But these, th there's going to be some images that are hard to see here, uh, but it's, it's what you need to see. It's what anybody who cares anything about Ukraine needs to see. It's what a lot of these supporters and cheerleaders for all this aid that's been going to Ukraine need to see, because these things are the ground truth reality. And, and a lot of this flag waving and cheerleading is just uh, blinding people to the harsh realities on the ground. And the, the truth is every piece of evidence that makes any sense that anybody wants to look at, that's a rational, unemotional analysis shows that the, the path that we're on right now will lead to destruction and the loss, the military loss of the war for Ukraine, not, not just a, a, you know, a setback, not just a bad negotiated settlement that they don't like but an absolute loss if we keep going on the path that we're on. And we have one of our show favorites to help us break this down and to explain why. And Colonel Jacques Beau, uh, who is a former member of the Swiss Strategic Intelligence Service, former NATO officer, uh, and, and just a really smart guy who cares about the truth. And we're really grateful to have you back, Colonel. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And uh, so let's jump right into it again here. Uh, so uh, on, a, on a Russian telegram channel yesterday, I saw a video that uh, was really disturbing to me. Uh, this is in a place called Berdichi. It's just outside of, of Avdivka. And this used to be a forest line here where a large contingent of Ukraine forces had uh, have been defending from. Uh, and I'm only going to show just a very few seconds of this video because this, this video was actually about six and a half minutes long. And in it, in the subsequent sections here, it shows huge numbers of casualties because when Russia came into this area, uh, they they completely annihilated everything that was in there. And, and Colonel, we're going to talk in a second about what this video shows a trained military eye besides just the carnage uh, that, that gives concern about what's coming next. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out, uh, though, especially is that uh, this area was defeated uh, or the Russians defeated the Ukraine here, not by some, you know, high casually producing infantry assault, you know, where they stormed across and took the position or whatever. According to the author of the video, it was primarily the FAB bombs that we've talked about before. Uh, these big, heavy glide bombs is another phrase people use. And the Tulsa flamethrower system, which is a thermal bar uh, munition on top of artillery, et cetera. So even the imbalance that people claim about between the artillery, which is between one in five to one in the disadvantage of Ukraine side, uh, which many people talk about, which Zelensky himself is the one that claims. This shows that Russia is inflicting enormous casualties on Ukraine, but they're saving their guys because they don't rush in on these Ukraine sides. So even though Russia already has a big manpower advantage, the casualty counts keep going up higher percentage-wise on the Ukraine side. Well, that that reminds me the pictures we could see on um, after World War One uh, when the French made picture of the battlefields, and that's exactly the same kind of landscape: uh, trees that were just uh, uh, destroyed, and and everything was destroyed. And that's that underlines, as you said, the importance of artillery. We underestimated the in the West the importance of artillery because we never had in the last 30 years, a situation in which Western armies confronted an enemy that had so much firepower. And in fact, we know that about 65 to 75% of the fatalities on the battlefields are the result of artillery. Now, if we consider that the, uh, the estimates I've made in my book, there are various period in the war, in this war, but we can assume that basically uh, Russia has a superiority of 10 to 1, meaning that they will have 10 to 1 more, I mean, the, the Ukrainians will have 10 to 1 more casualties. And, uh, and that's, that's exactly what we see. Now, another thing that needs to be mentioned here is the kind of defensive structure of the Ukrainians. And the the difference here, as we if we if we make the difference with what we saw in the Bakhmut area and also Lysychansk and this these battles that we we had we witnessed 
uh, in the late 2022. Well, in, in 2022, the battlefield was in fact prepared because we have to remember that the Ukrainian army in fact sieged the Donbass for eight years. And that's why you had extremely sophisticated um, defense structures or infrastructures that were literally built in the cities. And this, uh, that was Bahmut, Lizichansk, and so on and so forth. Well, these cities were literally fortified cities, and therefore they were very difficult to take uh, by the Russians, and, and that explains the, the harshness of the battle in Bahmut yeah. and, um, and so on. So today, they, the Ukrainians are more or less in a situation of hasty defense. And they dig their trenches very hastily in order to, to defend a little bit, as we saw uh, during, in certain phases of World War I. And they have in mind, and there was a project, I don't know how far it is implemented, there's an idea of the Ukrainians to build a very sophisticated fortified um, a line on the western uh, side of the Dnieper River because they wanted to have something which is uh, similar to the Surovikin line. Remember that yeah. the Russians, they had six months or more to build more, yeah. their... Their, their line of defense, and that's why this line of defense resisted so well the uh, so-called counteroffensive of Ukraine. So it, it, it may be that the Ukrainians are planning to do such a line, but on the, as I said, on the western side of the river Dnieper. Now, now where they are right now is a situation where they have no room to defend. So they have just this this hasty uh, uh, trenches, but they are extremely vulnerable to artillery fire and and as you mentioned, these uh, uh, um, flying bombs or, or the, these yeah. guided uh, bombs like the Fab, or you have the uh, UPAB. Um, uh, 1500, uh, 500, and the, the Fab uh, uh, 3000. So these are this is the situation. And now, as you said, we are in a situation where the Russians will, they gained some momentum after Avdivka because Avdivka was probably one of the last uh, fortified areas where they could, they had some difficulty. And now it seems that the, the offensive capabilities of the Russians gain momentum, and yeah. the Russians want to keep that momentum. So yeah. that means that everything we do on the Western side to support the Ukrainian will just make the Russians going faster, in fact. And Which is uh, the opposite of what's always claimed. But, you know, one of the biggest issues now, uh, everybody's been talking about these aid packages that have been passed, and we're going to talk about those in a little bit more detail shortly. Uh, but really the issue, and I think you and I have talked about this a number of times, in warfare, it's not the money or the machines as much as it is the manpower. That's the crucial issue where Ukraine just doesn't have it. And uh, here are uh, some American politicians were talking about on Fox News Sunday recently uh, about what that is. And, and notice the claim that uh, Senator Graham makes, which I don't think is right. Ukraine doesn't have the manpower it needs. That, and that, that is and that, the, and, and that are Go, go. I factories. just got back. I was there two weeks ago. They changed our conscription laws. They've got all the manpower they need. They need weapons is what they don't have is weapons. Now, the, uh, the former commander of the U.S. 1st Armored Division, uh, a hurtling, uh, actually a few days ago, kind of jumped on this same bandwagon and talked about how it's a man, the, that all Ukraine has to do is just change this mobilization law and everything will be fine. Check this out. Ukraine needs the mobilization of more soldiers. They have been on the battlefield for two and a half years, and that is just takes an incredible uh, account of fatigue psychological damage and just the 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 toughness of being in the trenches in the front lines will really be a morale factor so mr zelensky recently passed a new mobilization law that will be critical so we're going to see the front stabilize a little bit over the next several weeks and then potentially if ukraine can not only get their new mobilized soldiers get them trained get them into offensive operations and get them into the ability to retake ground that's what I'm looking for. 
Yeah, a couple of things that stood out to me, Carlin. I want to get your thoughts on this. On the first one, you had the the uh, the Senator Graham there just say, oh, pff, they got plenty of people. Don't worry about that. I've seen them because he thinks that a man wearing a uniform is a trained soldier. To him, there's no difference. He doesn't understand it. But the general is supposed to understand it. And actually, in the first part of that clip, he was saying things that actually do make sense. He's talking about how they've had so few people, they haven't been able to rotate people off the, the line. So some of them have been on the front for years, which is a horrible psychological problem to have to endure and lowers their unit effectiveness on the first point there. But then all of a sudden, it's like he just ignores that and just says, yeah, they're going to mobilize a bunch of people and then they're going to you know, get ready for to go on the offense. And I, as someone who's supposed to have been training armored division troops and should know better than anyone how long it takes to form cohesive units, you've said on a previous show, I think the very last one we did, about how a, an army is a system of systems and it has to have all these things together, none of which exists for the Ukraine side right now. And then he's talking about going on the offense. I just don't understand how they can talk that way. Well, I'm sometimes concerned about the level of our generals. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there was, uh, during World War I, there, there was uh, Clemenceau, who was a French politician, and he used to, to, to ask, do you know why generals are stupid? Well, because they were colonels before. So <laughs> that was, it was kind of a joke. I mean, you're a colonel, I'm a colonel, so I can joke about colonel. No, the right. problem here is is as you said the, the the main issue here i'm not talking about lindsey graham because lindsey graham was even saying that he was ready to fight up to the last ukrainian which is totally absurd and cynical but talking about the military issue as you said a, 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 an army or a defense organization is a system it needs to have the proper doctrine the proper equipment and the proper uh, command and control structure and a proper uh, um, skilled uh, individuals to do that. And all that has to fit together. No, it's not the question of how high tech weapons you have, how much high tech weapons you have, and so on and so forth. You can see, for instance, in Israel, you have uh, uh, the, the, this Palestinian resistance with very uh, um, uh, primitive equipment, so to say, handmade and, and uh, locally made equipment. And on the other side, you have uh, the, the Israeli army, which is one of the most technologically advanced army in the Middle East. And, and uh, the, um, the Hamas and other organizations still uh, have some, some success. And the reason is that the Palestinians, even if they are, they have less, a, a lower number, lower uh, a number of individuals and, and less weapons, they are suited for the kind of warfare they are performing. And this is a, a, a kind of, there is a system, the tunnels, the doctrine, the number of individuals, the way they, they behave, all that is consistent. And that's, this is this consistency, which is the key to success, you may have a, a, a magnificent success or, or a, a, a less magnificent one, but you have success because of the consistency of your system, the integration of your system. And that's exactly what is missing in Ukraine. You know, the, the Ukrainian soldiers themselves said that those who were recruited last year, end of last year, they said I was recruited and after one week I was thrown into the, on the battlefield. Meaning that this guy had just one week to train, to use a weapon, and th that's just cannon fodder. This is, yeah. this is just that. And you cannot win war, even if you have, a, 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 let's say, manpower superiority in terms of number, if you don't have the skills, no way you can win. You know, I remember having um, uh, uh, I, I, having this uh, book from the U.S. Marine Corps at the time that was probably published in the uh, late 50s or early 60s that says small units win small wars because if you have a, a unit which is, it, it doesn't need to be a huge force. It just needs to be a force suited 
for the kind of warf warfare yeah. you want to, uh, to 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 perform. It doesn't need even to have tanks. I mean, you can find uh, you can uh, fight a mechanized uh, assault just with anti-tank weapon. The only thing what you need is, in fact, a consistent doctrine that allow you to use your anti-tank weapons with with the right people in the the right, let's say, a, a movement, so to say. A fire and movement uh, uh, principle, and and this is it. You you need just to have all that, but that's the 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 difficulty on of of Ukraine. They have equipment from all over the world, equipment equipment ranging from the uh, 1960s to the uh, late 90s, uh, which are not even compatible with them. We know yeah. that, for instance, they can they cannot even use the same artillery shells in the various uh, uh, guns and howitzers they have, because even if it's a NATO caliber, they are not made for this kind of, of shell. As a result, this is a, a huge logistical problem, a huge command and control problem, and, and they don't even have the skilled p personnel to do that. Well, so, yeah, I was going to say that I actually saw a, a, U a Ukrainian report just yesterday uh, to talk about how many of the soldiers were complaining because a lot of these vehicles that we've given the Ukraine side, the M113 armor personnel carrier, many of which were just, uh, we just sent a bunch more, by the way, in this current aid package. They're complaining that more than half of them don't even work because they're so old. And so they've had to cannibalize a bunch of them just to get the other yeah. ones to run. So that just, you know, they're trying to figure this out on the fly. It said sometimes because they didn't have ink or their language books, they, they actually broke some of them because they use them improperly. I mean, this just goes to the whole system thing you're talking about. And that's just one type of vehicle. And there's tons of others. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the one, the 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 M113 is uh, is a very old one. I used to to have one in my battalions. I mean, I have several in my battalion. They, they are completely outdated, and and even the armor is no longer suited for the kind of weapons we have on current battlefield, especially not the drones. So, and and we have to. You mentioned the Ukrainian soldiers complaining. Uh, I saw recently an interview of a lady, it's Maria. Berlinskaya. She is a Ukrainian officer. She is in charge of coordinated, coordinating equipment for Ukrainian Air Force. And she was saying in this interview that most of the equipment that was provided by the West was, was totally unsuited for the kind of warf warfare that was conducted in Ukraine. So we are exactly in that problem. It's not the question of the number of billion you can put on the, this battlefield. It's just a question that now what we do, it's just putting patches on, on a yeah. kind of patchwork army, and that will certainly not lead to success. But again, I'm, I'm back to the, 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 the fundamentals, we have to remember that the purpose of this conflict was not to help Ukraine, but to weaken Russia. And as of today, and that applies especially for the Europeans at this stage, the, the Americans start to have a different view because because of the presidential election. But in Europe, people think that the longer this war would last, the higher is the probability that this could destabilize the, 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 the power or the regime, if you want, in, in, in Russia. And this is, this is completely wishful thinking. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, that's a, that's a good transition here. Going back for a second to the theme of, you know, who who are these generals and how do they get to their stars is a question and the issue of trying to make this drag out. Here is uh, another four star former general, David Petraeus, talking about how he wants this to go a long time. Check this out. You know, I, I was not one who believed that you had to actually end endless wars. Um, in fact, I fought, I opposed the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Yes, it was frustrating. Yes, it was maddening. Yes, our partners in Kabul were not all that we might hope they would be. We only had 3,500 troops on the ground. We hadn't lost a soldier in a year and a half. There was no reason. We had $25 billion and an $850 billion defense budget. So we, we need to be careful about this. This one, we need to ensure that Ukraine prevails when, when this is over. That, to me, that's just uh, beyond nonsense to say that you want Ukraine to prevail when they're on the road to death right now. And you saw that one video I showed you. That's one of many, I assure you, 
uh, and it could have gone on a lot longer. But you, you just see in the front line move back and forth. You see that this is not going in a direction. But yeah, he's thinking long term. I could also have shown you a video from Zelensky a couple of days ago where he was saying he wants support from America on a 10 year plan. Stoltenberg's <laughs> talking a 10 year plan. But Colonel, I'm not sure that the Ukrainian army is going to last this summer. Well, in fact, there was a study on demographics in the New York Times recently that shows that, in fact, Ukraine doesn't have the manpower in the range of the, the individuals aged between 18 to 30 or something like that. And, and Ukraine will, will doesn't have this potential, meaning that if you want to prolong this war, you will have some external uh, intervention and that's why we'll probably talk later about the macron and so on and his promises to to go because the ukraine by itself will not be able to sustain the war but the the the, the, the problem that we, that is addressed also by petrius here we mentioned afghanistan the problem of afghanistan here and the withdrawal in afghanistan is not so much that us withdrew from afghanistan it's the way it did it and you know the 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 russians went out of afghanistan in 1989 but after they left the government they put in place stayed for two years while on the, 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 when right. the, the, the Westerners left, the government stayed in pl place for two days. So we see that the, the real problem of the Westerners is that they don't have a strategy. And again, we are back in the idea of the systemic approach to war. We don't have strategies. We don't have an exit strategy. We know when we start the war, but we don't know when we when, when and how we want to end these wars. And that's exactly the problem you have seen in Iraq, in Syria, in in Libya, in the Sahel with the French. They have exactly they had exactly the same problem in Northern Africa. They start the war, but they don't know how to finish it. As a yes. result, what yeah. happens is exactly what happened in the Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso, that the government just expelled these soldiers. And that applies to the Niger right now with the U.S. forces. Right, so right. exactly this, right. This is, a, this, is, this is our problem. We don't have strategies. We have tactical leaders. Even our generals are just corporals with stars on their shoulders. That's Ooh, all. That's a good way to put that. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to move ship to a different topic here in just a second. But before I do, um, I actually want to uh, put up here a question by one of our audience members. Where'd that one go? I lost it here. Um, oh, yeah. So this is an issue not many people even know about here. But one of our guests asked, uh, does Colonel Bo think that the West will support Zelensky after May 20th when he is no longer the legal head of state? And for those who may not know what that means, uh, the, the presidential term uh, that was in the Constitution that he was elected to ends on May 20th. And since he decided not to have an election, uh, now there won't be one. Will that be an issue, whether domestically or internationally, for the, uh, the credibility of Zelensky to now be in a territory where there is no legal constitutional authority for him to remain president. How do you see that playing out? Well, that might be a problem domestically because if the population see that the there is no this this war leads nowhere and that it leads just to more casualties, fatalities and all that, they may reclaim the power if you want. And they may say, no, we want election or we want to change the the, the guy who is uh, heading the 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 government. But on the uh, Western, I mean, in Europe especially, it, Zelensky announced a few months ago that he would not make this election. And that was that was well accepted in the, the political uh, uh, world in, in the West and especially in Europe. So I think nobody will question that because uh, as of today, it's, it's admitted that Ukraine is in a war situation. And to a certain extent, I can, I can even accept this idea because if you if you are in a war situation it's hard to have let's say a, 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 a election that are that should come into a, an atmosphere of serenity if you don't have that atmosphere there is uh, i i can 
I can follow the idea that it's not the best time to have a, a presidential election. Personally. Yeah, I, well, I think that, I think even the, the domestic people can probably come to that same conclusion if it's going somewhere good. But I think to your point, exactly. if it starts to be clear to them that it's not now, then they're not going to be OK with that. But we'll see how that plays out. Uh, next thing I want to shift to here just a second. Uh, and again, it's going to kind of reinforce a point that you've made already in terms of the the absence of a system. Now, many in the West have cheered this whole uh, package that the United States passed, uh, $61 billion. We've talked before that actually only a small portion of that is actually going to Ukraine. The rest of it's going to the American uh, military industrial complex. So that's one issue on its own. But the second issue is that uh, lots of other European nations have also come across with a, a bunch of armored vehicles and uh, some other things. Now, on paper, what I'm about to show you might look really good. And to many, it does. But I want you to tell me if you see a problem with this. Roll that tape. While they wait for reinforcements from the latest mobilization law, as well as lethal aid and ammunition deliveries from their US and European partners. A coalition of European countries aim for the first deliveries of 24 F-16s to start this summer, out of a total of 97 meant for Ukraine. Spain is about to send an additional 19 Leopard 2A4s to Ukraine. Sweden and Denmark have announced the joint production of 35 new CB-90 midlife update infantry fighting vehicles also meant for Ukraine. Meanwhile, Bulgaria will transfer 100 BTR-60PB they had in storage. The US pledged 250 M1117 Guardian armored security vehicles, equipped with a 40mm Mark 19 grenade launcher and a 50 caliber heavy machine gun. And the Christmas list goes on, with France promising to send hundreds of its VAB armored personnel carriers to Ukraine as well as a total of 78 Caesar howitzers. Now, the thing that jumps out to me about that, aside from the issue you talked about, is about the, the hodgepodge of all these different things, each of which needs its own system, none of which Ukraine has. But there's there's not that much lethal stuff in there, like those the Caesar howitzers or the Panzer Howitzer 2000s from the, the German side, which, which is also included. There's not that many of those. And there's lots of actually hundreds of, of armored vehicles and armored personnel carriers. But that's I'm not sure that that's really useful in a defensive warfare. Uh, how do you how do you make out all of that stuff to combine? What, how much useful it, will it make? Well, what strikes me, for instance, is the total absence of anti-aircraft or anti-missile systems like the Patriot or, or similar systems. So meaning that, again, we try to prolong the war and not to help Ukraine because uh, what we are providing, I mean, the VAB, for instance, the French VAB, which was designed in the, the 60s uh, for uh, colonial warfare, basically, to Africa and things like that, is probably good in, in the desert warfare, but it's not suited for the Ukraine, especially when you have this muddy terrain that you have in, uh, in autumn or, or September or uh, in, the, in the early spring. So meaning that we are not exactly helping the, the Ukrainians. I mean, all the, the vehicles you mentioned are old equipment. By the way, interestingly enough, most of this equipment comes from the, um, the inventory of, of the armies themselves, meaning that we are talking about the eventuality and the possibility of Russia to attack Europe, but at the same time, European countries just deplete their own inventory to send it to Ukraine, which may, makes absolutely no sense and which underlines the, 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 the lies that we are, in fact, or the narrative that we are, we are uh, uh, disseminating about this, this conflict. I think, again, we are just providing, take the, 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 the BTR 60 PB. It's a, it's, a, it's a vehicle that traced back to the late 50s. So what what it's a good vehicle, by the way. It's rugged and all that. But, I mean, is it suited for the kind of warfare that yeah. Ukraine... We have seen, and now we have seen, especially in this uh, trophy museum that uh, um, Moscow just uh, opened uh, last last weekend, and we see all this uh, modern equipment, this uh, this Western equipment. I think everything that we send to Ukraine will end up in some kind of museum uh, like right. this. 
<laughs> That's the only effect. So I, I don't really see the point of doing that. And again, that comes back to the question we discussed before. What is the Western strategy? Because even if we want to prolong, I mean, uh, for instance, uh, uh, General Petraeus said uh, Ukraine must prevail. What does prevail mean? mean. What does it mean? <laughs> And that, that may an explanation, by the way, of the insistence and the uh, and the the, the uh, this idea uh, that they should destroy the Crimea bridge, for instance, the Kerch bridge, because that could be a way of say of of providing this idea or the picture of a prevailing uh, Ukraine. Okay, may I, let's let's uh, assume that. But that's all. I mean, what means prevailing? And that's the West, as well as the Ukrainians, by the way, because what, what I say about the Ukrainian army applies to, for instance, what we have seen with uh, the, the previous uh, commander, not uh, Sielski, but... Uh, oh, Zeluzhny. Uh, Zeluzhny, exactly. We never have we, we have never seen a plan on the Ukrainian side. What do they consider as a victory? What do they want? Of course, we can we we can assume their ultimate goal is to push the Russians back to the border. Okay, we can, but we know that it's not possible. So based on that, what is what is victory? What means prevailing? You know, and, and that's exactly the problem the, the, the West and Ukraine has, by the way, because they don't know where they're heading to. There's an objective, a military objective, means that you know where you're heading to. You know where you put your forces. You know where you put your main effort. You know where you will put the, the bulk of, of, of your, your, your main equipment, uh, aviation or whatever. So the... But if you don't have an objective, then how do you use your equipment? Well, you know, it, this it, is you, you, you say they know it won't work, but again, getting back to this whole general thing, people listen to generals, right? Civilians do, yeah. they, they see four stars on their chest, a the retired general, whatever they assume you can't get to that position unless you really know what you're doing. But here's the problem I'm not going to show you these videos here, but recently we've had. Uh, General Ben Hodges, a former three-star general, commander of U.S. Army in Europe. Uh, General Jack Keane, a, a four-star general, uh, vice chief of staff of the Army. Both say that with long-range ATACMS missiles, we can drive Ukraine out, I'm sorry, Russia out of the Crimea with just long-range missiles, which is absurd for anybody who has basic military understanding. And yet here's these generals actually claiming that that can work. And if they think that, then it's not surprising that they don't have a plan for how to win. Well, that, that's exactly the problem. But that shows also the level of our leadership in the West at large, because what you see with the generals applies to the politicians as well. They don't have an, a, a real, or, or, or let's say, tangible or realistic objectives. This is just wishful thinking from the very beginning, from the political to the military side. You know, and but for the military, on the military side, I'm I'm very harsh towards the military because when you say, when someone says that he is able to to expel the Russians from Crimea just with a couple of attacks and missiles, this guy is just stupid because <laughs> first of all, the, yeah. no, there is no, no other. I there agree. No other. There's, there's a lot of worse words you can use, but there's none better. <laughs> this is the most elegant, this is the yeah. most elegant one, <laughs> the most polite one. But right. this, this is just amazing. I mean, the Russians have developed so much electronic warfare and anti-missile devices or equipment or systems that can that can basically uh, 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 counter all these kind of attacks. I mean, maybe not all. Maybe you may, st may still have one, two, three percent that goes through the defense. Okay, but what, what I mean is that with a few attacks on this missile we provide to Ukraine, how can we assume that we, we will can just push the Russian back out of Crimea? Especially Crimea, because Crimea, remember that Crimea was uh, 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 Russian well before Ukraine existed and, and was even uh, independent when Ukraine 
became independent. So uh, you, uh, Crimea became became independent, so to say, on the 20th January 1991, while Ukraine became independent six months later. So yeah, Crimea... Yeah, nobody knows that. <laughs> well, nobody knows that, but there was a referendum, the True. only and yeah. first referendum in the Soviet Union, by the way, and and according to this referendum, you, uh, Crimea regained its status that it had in 1945 as the uh, socialist, uh, the uh, autonomous socialist republic of Crimea, and that was in January 1991, and that's the reason why the Crimeans have absolutely it's out of the question to come back to 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 yeah. Ukraine. Yeah. It's out of a question because they were independent even before Ukraine. The, 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 the official history today forgets about this referendum, but it does exist. You may even find it on Wikipedia if you want. So yeah, yeah, yeah. meaning that we are distorting history. And the, 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 the Russians, they had even troops in Crimea in, 19, in uh, 2014. Right. And that was absolutely legal. There were agreements with Crimea. So they will not abandon Crimea. And in yeah, addition under to any that, circumstances. Right. And, Crimea and, is and, a strategic point. And, and he, so when you look at all of this together, it, it again shows to the title of this episode, the road to death. Ukraine is on a road to death because we are blind to the fundamentals that are at play. We're oblivious to the difficulties that we're actually putting the Ukraine side in. The Ukraine leadership doesn't seem to care about that and just blindly wants to go back to 1991 borders, despite all the things like you just talked about, et cetera. And then here, instead of coming to a rational conclusion, which is, damn, we better make a negotiated settlement right now to get the best terms we can get, because if, if not, then Ukraine's going to end up suffering a military defeat and there won't be any negotiations. It'll just be terms of surrender. That's what we should do. Here's what we are doing, though. Here's Macron again, after making these claims a couple of months ago, according to the news today, Gary, if you can throw that up there, he vows to send uh, troops to Ukraine to boost if Putin's forces break through the front lines. And that's what we've talked about here. There's every evidence that is going to happen here coming up. And will uh, uh, Macron actually send troops into Ukraine to fight Russia? It is insane and absurd to even talk about that to me. And yet here we are. Well, that, that's exactly the problem, that people don't think. They just see the war as they wish it would it would uh, uh, go, but they don't see the war as it is. And now what, what happens, I mean, if, if I follow, uh, I would apply the Russian doctrine, if you want. I would say uh, on the Russian side, what I would say is that we have to destroy completely Ukraine because... The, the problem is that if you keep Ukraine as it is and will all these uh, movement, the, the um, European uh, uh, ideas of supplying new weapons and try to make uh, the Ukraine entering NATO and all that. I mean, if you don't want to have this problem, you just have to crush Ukraine completely. You have to destroy Ukraine. You have to make Ukraine disappearing. And interestingly enough, we have we know that the, um, the we know the text that the Zelensky proposed uh, in March 2022, and we see that the Russians were ready to go uh, with that proposition. And this proposal was that uh, uh, Ukraine would still exist today if the uh, Boris Johnson and the others would not have advised him to withdraw his uh, his uh, proposal. So meaning that the, the Russians didn't want to destroy Ukraine. They just wanted to destroy the threat, the military threat yeah. towards the Donbass. And, and now we are in a situation that the Russians feel constrained to destroy Ukraine. So we are just pushing the Russians to go forward. We are just pressing them to go beyond what they wanted to do. So it's and, and, tragic. And here's, the, here's the irony. Uh, so here's this head, uh, headline here in uh, in the Telegraph. I think, Gary, if you can throw that one up there. Uh, this was, I believe, also from today. Yeah. 
so they recognize Putin's crushing new offensive could end could be the end of Ukraine. So that should lead to the conclusion that we talked about here. Let's come to negotiate a settlement. We could have done it in, in uh, April of 2022, and so many people would still be alive. That's what should be. But here's the conclusion of this author here. He says, ensuring that Russia is roundly defeated in Ukraine is not is vital, not just in terms of deterring Putin from launching further acts of aggression into Europe. It is essential if the likes like China, Iran, North Korea are also to be made to understand that their, their antagonistic effort attitude toward the West will meet the same resolute response as Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, blah, blah, blah. You keep seeing all this stuff. Basically, the whole world will fall apart if all these other nations are not made to understand that they're that they're not going to win. So he's acting, suggesting that we double down, which is absurd because this goes back again to what you said just a minute ago. This is the world we wish it would exist. And so we are taking actual actions based on the world that doesn't really exist. And how can that have anything but a destructive result, I think? Well, in fact, we are still on the picture of the NATO we had probably 40 years ago with a huge uh, uh, military industrial base that could provide a lot of weapons and ammunition and all that. We had huge armies, especially in Europe. If I take the, the Swiss army, we were, we, we were eight times more powerful than we are today. And mm. that's the same for the Bundeswehr. That was the same for the... Uh, the British, uh, they had the British Army of the Rhine, which was uh, uh, much more powerful than the whole British Army today. Oh, that's a good point. So, yeah, yeah we, we, we had this, and we still have this picture. The problem is that it's a picture of the past, and we are no longer in a position to confront Russia the way we we planned or had in mind to do to do uh, uh, 40 years ago and this is this is a little bit the problem we are a problem with the the consistency with reality and this is exactly what this uh, uh, this uh, uh, text just says you know if if we wanted to not having a problem if we wanted to have a russia that is compliant with what we want in the West and all that. The best way of doing it is to have good relation with them. So that's that's simply the best way. The Russians never ask to 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 uh, attack uh, Europe and so the, this uh, whole thing, the unprovoked. We discussed that already. Yeah. We know that it was provoked, and we know why it was provoked. And the same apply. I mean, you mentioned Taiwan. And all that, and this, this text, there was this idea of of China wanting to uh, invade uh, uh, Taiwan. You have to remember that in the mind of the Chinese, Taiwan already belongs to China. Right. Right. You know, so, so they don't know to take Taiwan because Taiwan belongs to China. And by the way, the Taiwanese think the same thing. That for the Taiwanese, there is only one China. As for the mainland China, for both of them, there is only one China. The only point or difference is that for Taiwan, yeah. the, 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 the government should be in Taipei, and for Beijing, the government should be in Beijing. This is the only difference. But on the principle of having one China, they, there is, they don't, the Taiwanese don't want to be independent from China. They just yeah. want to have a different government. And this is this is exactly the point. So we don't understand these conflicts. We just, in fact, we stir the, these these conflicts just for the sake of our own uh, domestic uh, uh, political objectives or ideology or whatever. But we we are not solving the problem. And the reason why we have a, a shrink uh, or, or military industrial complex has shrunk in the West in the 90s. It's not because we didn't want to have armies, but because we didn't feel it was necessary to have right. an army anymore. You know, and, and, because... and here's the real here's the real irony. Uh, uh, just one of many, actually, uh, is to your point that Russia never wanted to fight a big war. They wanted it to be over earlier. They just want security. They've been very clear about that from years, years gone by. They're still saying the same thing today. Uh, but because the West keeps doing all the things that we've talked about here, you see this headline here that on top of what Russia has already done, 
with their uh, military industrial complex and all the weapons that they have created. In fact, they're already at somewhere around uh, 250,000 artillery shells per month when where the West is is maybe at uh, 45 or 50, I think, altogether. Uh, now then, Russia ramps it up even more. And when you read read the article that it was talking about there, that was from yesterday, uh, that they're uh, con- you know continuing to go on the assumption that, that, that they're going to have to do this. And so all these disparities are only going to increase. Now, here's the, the reason why that's so ironic is because, to your point, fortunately, not all of the people in the West are, are have lost their minds like these generals I show. Uh, we actually have John Mearsheimer, who actually looked at this very sober, very sanely, and here's what his recommendations are. I mean, if you think about this, if we had created a neutral Ukraine, let me put it differently. Ukraine was, according to its constitution, and its declaration of sovereignty in 1990, a neutral country. It, it abandoned neutrality in December December of 2014. Just think about that. So if we had left it alone, Ukraine would be intact today to include Crimea. Just think about that. All these dead people would not be dead. Which, yeah, that's in a sense what you said a while ago. So that's what the reality is. And, and instead, in, in this pursuit of the unattainable, I think, Colonel, that probably the likelihood is that at some point, I don't know if it's going to be this summer or if it could possibly drag into next year. I doubt it. But most likely, I, I view that the Ukraine army is going to eventually collapse and be defeated in the field. And then there won't be any Ukraine side to, to you know, that's anything besides whatever uh, Russia decides in terms of surrender. How, how do you see that? And do you think that there is a shot that they collapse before this summer's over? Well, I don't have any timeline, uh, to be honest, because there are so many factors uh, that uh, that intervene in that. So I have no idea when it will come. But I'm convinced that the way the West is pressing Ukraine to continue that war is probably uh, um, will push the Russians to go to uh, towards a dis- total destruction of, of Ukraine and its potential. Now, an unknown factor is what we just uh, briefly mentioned before, is what happens domestically, because we see more and more individuals in within uh, uh, Western, I mean, Ukraine, in, in the Western part of Ukraine, that in fact, fight against the government. You know, there is something we never mention in our media, is that you have a strong uh, resistance movement in the western part of Ukraine. These are individuals who uh, maybe they are Russian speaking, I, I'm certainly some of them, but uh, uh, probably not all of them, who have a, a, a resistance and sabotage action in the rear of the Ukrainian forces. And we have seen recently they have made a uh, um, sabotage activities on the railroad, the uh, Ukrainian railroad system, on some ammunition and fuel depots in, in Ukraine. So we have a situation that, in fact, is a little bit more um, uh, uh, troubled in the western part of Ukraine, as we understand that in our media. And that may affect the way the Ukrainian people, and you see the resistance, by the way, of Ukrainians in, uh, the, the, in, um, in resisting uh, recruitment. I mean, Oleksiy Arestovich mentioned uh, recently in an interview yeah. that there were 100,000 guys who evaded uh, a conscription, meaning that you have more and more people resisting the government. And you see when you have uh, forced recruitment on the, on the road, on the streets, in, in some villages, and even in big cities now in Ukraine, you have the population that attack the recruiters. So meaning that yeah. the situation within Ukraine it becomes even more instable. And the you, you mentioned this question of the mandate of... Um, of Zelensky, we may have some changes that may affect the way Ukraine understands its way to to end the war. And you may have individuals that take power or take influence. I don't know how and uh, I don't know when it it would happen, but we may have uh, from the inside of Ukraine a movement that say no stop. 
Now we cannot go, we cannot move. You know, Zelensky maintained itself in the in power because of the SBU, the, the Interna Internal Security Service. There is a huge repression ongoing in Ukraine precisely because of these uh, resistance and uh, uh, um, sabotage groups that uh, operates in the western part of Ukraine, meaning that the, the government becomes more and more unpopular. So we may have a situation that the this is not only the Russian that will destroy Ukraine, but there might be an implosion from inside coming from inside. So I do, I have no I don't know. It's a, it's an option. That's a reason why it's very difficult to set a, a timeline yeah. for yeah. what will happen. But at the end of the day, I'm convinced that Ukraine will not remain the Ukraine we knew in the last years. That's for I sure. That, uh, yeah, that's for sure. I don't think there's any any question about that. Well, listen, Colonel, thank you so much for coming on today and, and providing with us with such clarity and, as always, giving us uh, points of view that we didn't know before and information we didn't have before. Thank you very much for, for providing that today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Always a pleasure to having you on and always a pleasure to having you guys come and join us and watch. Uh, I always try to throw up some of the comments that we have here uh, because I, I love some of the things you guys say. And you see, we we put some questions, uh, something that you have sometime too. And as, as I think I've said recently, I, I, I'm not always able to watch those comments as I'm on the air for obvious reasons. Uh, but we do have an email address uh, that we'd like to share with you. And so uh, anytime you have some ideas, if you say, hey, you know, maybe have this guest or here's some ideas that I may have or just want to communicate with us, we invite you to come and do that. It's it's uh, Daniel Davis Deep Dive Army at Gmail dot com, because we are, after all, genuinely in this all together. We're, we're right there with you and we want you to be able to communicate with us and back and forth on that. We really value you and we do treasure, uh, you know, having the opportunity to bring guests like Colonel Bo onto your screen. So thank you very much. Be sure to like and subscribe, share this with your friends uh, because we want to spread this to as many people as possible so that more and more people get access to the truth and what's actually going on in the ground instead of just some of the nonsense they see on mainstream media. Thank you. And we will see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.